I'll tell you what, it is, um, it is such a blessing to be up here and to hear the voices of the children of God singing. Um, hopefully, and it's our hope, and it's always my hope that you're singing past me and singing to Jesus Christ on the cross. I mean, I, I try to explain as well to, and I our, our, our know our team knows also that um, our purpose up here in leading worship is merely to focus us as a body of Christ and step aside and let Jesus Christ receive all of the glory. So when we're singing together, sometimes if I'm looking at you, it's just because I just wanna, I want to share in that moment with you of, of being a brother and sister uh, or a brother and brother in Christ, lifting up the same words to our Lord. Hallelujah. This morning, we are in the second, ser- second part of a um, message series in, in Haggai, or as my five-year-old son calls it, Haggai. Uh, this was actually supposed to be a two-part series, but I'm, I apologize, it's going to now be a three-part series, okay? Um, and the reason was, the more I got into chapter two... The more that I realized that way, there was um, there were some things that I felt like I needed to meditate on a little bit longer, uh, rather than jumping from one thing to another. And hey, we've got flexibility to do that. We can we can take uh, take the second chapter and expand it out into two into two messages um, because I feel like God is really trying to tell us something here. God's trying to make sure that we're 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 soaking this in and we're not rushing through it. Um, before I begin, let me pray for us. Lord, I'm grateful that you've given us this time together. Lord, I'm grateful that you've given us your word. I'm grateful that you've given us prophets like Haggai. Lord, we know that you gave him for a specific time and purpose to the people of Israel to build them up, to prophesy to them, to, to give them the word of the Lord. But at the same time, Lord, your eternal ways and your eternal presence is also through his words because it builds us up even here today. So I pray, Lord, that his words, his encouragement, uh, finds uh, a way into our heart in that we see your, um, just your eternal truth that flows out of this ancient book, this ancient man. But the words of God reign true even today. May it strengthen us, Lord. May it grow us closer to be like you. In Christ I pray. Amen. So last week we began in the book of Haggai. We were uh, in chapter 1. And if you haven't had opportunity yet, open up your Bibles or your phone apps or whatever you want to look at the scripture in to Haggai. We're going to be in chapter 2 today. Uh, Just a quick uh, catch up for those who weren't able to be here last week or wasn't able to to know um, where we started. So Haggai is speaking, this is about 520 B.C., about 520 B.C., so a little north of 500 years before uh, the birth of Christ. And Haggai is prophesying to the, um, the nation of Israel after they have returned back to Jerusalem from being exiled in Babylon. They've returned back to this city. They've been allowed to go back um, by the Persian king. And whenever they got back to Jerusalem, they found that their city was in ruins, the temple was in ruins, and they had spent a lot of time trying to to clean up and straighten up and getting it back into working order. Well, over the course of time, uh, they were supposed to, or they initially had attempted to start rebuilding the temple, which was the central part of the of the city. But there was there was some um, there was some. Uh, some people that were against them and trying to cause confusion and trying to cause all kinds of strife as they started to rebuild the temple. So they stopped, they paused on rebuilding the temple, and instead of pushing through it and trying to be faithful to rebuilding the temple in the midst of the opposition, they paused for some some almost 20 years that they had put a pause on building God's temple. And in the middle of that, they decided to work on their own houses. So they, they were building their own houses. They were fixing everything of them, uh, for themselves. And, they, and God's temple had still lied in ruins. So Haggai's first, uh, the first message that he gave in Haggai chapter 1 was God reminding Israel that, hey, you guys are living in nice houses, but my house is lying in ruins. 
And you need to recognize as well that there's a lot of things that you're, that, that you're doing in life right now that are unfruitful. And the reason is because you failed to put me first. So the people started, the people repented. They came together. They started to rebuild the temple of God. And now it's been about 28 days, a little less than a month, since the people had, had repented. They've gone up into the hills. They've gotten the timber, and they started to rebuild God's temple. And this is where we pick up in chapter 2. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through Haggai the prophet. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and to the remnant of the people. So God is telling Haggai, speak to the leaders, but also speak to the people and, and tell them this. Who is left among you who saw this house, speaking of the temple, in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel. This is the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all of you people of the land. This is the Lord's declaration. Work, for I am with you. The declaration of the Lord of hosts. This is the promise I made to you whenever you came out of Egypt, and my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. So what has happened is now some 28 days they've been, the, the people of, uh, of Israel have been rebuilding this temple. And they've taken a little break and they've sat back with their bologna sandwiches. And they're looking at the temple and they're going, this looks like, this looks like garbage. I don't know, have you guys ever tried a project to where you've worked on? I mean, like you have started on something and you have beat it, and you've cut it, and you've painted it, and you've, and you've grinded it, and then you've painted it again, and then you beat it again, and you looked at it again, you're like, it still, looks, it still looks like rubbish. That is so frustrating. When you, when you, when you go to get, come together uh, on a specific project, and you work so hard at it, and you want it to look good, but yet the more that you reflect on it, the worse it looks as you get to working on it. And I believe that's where the people of Israel were. They, they had spent all this time working and trying to rebuild, and they step back and they take a look and they're going, yeah, it's not so good. And you know what? The thing is, God knows it too. God recognized it too. He looked at him and he goes, yeah, so you guys take a look at the temple that you rebuilt. It doesn't look like a whole lot, does it? And they're like, no, no, it doesn't. Um, because it wasn't just evident to the people, it was evident to Haggai, it was evident to the, the high priest and the governor, it was evident to God. It's like, yeah, it's just not working out kind of like we had intended. So there was a fact. The, the temple was lackluster compared to its former glory, compared to its former um, po, uh, pre-exilic glory. Solomon's temple was a building to behold. It was, it was just chock full of gold and, and, and gems and, and just and it was so ornate and beautiful and monstrous that people it was it was the pride of the nation. People in every nation around would look on this temple of Solomon and go, man, Israel is something. Look at that temple. Look at look at what they have built for their God. It is amazing. It's beautiful. It was kind of like their, their crown jewel. But now, this new temple, as they're looking back and going, yeah, this doesn't really look anything like what Solomon had tried to build. It was a shadow of the splendor of Solomon's temple. And that's exactly what God had spoken through Haggai. He said, look, he says, how many of you guys were around to see the temple in its former splendor? Doesn't it look like, it looks like nothing right now, doesn't it? It looks like, looks like garbage, doesn't it? And, you know, that's got to feel really good, right? When the boss comes and says, yeah, it, look, it, look, it looks like garbage. But God does something that only God does. He says, hey, it's not there yet. It's not where you want it to be. It's not where I want it to be yet. But I'm going to encourage you to press on because I'm with you. 
And the thing is, he, he tells the people to press on. He tells them that he's with them to take courage, just as he told Joshua to have courage. Just as he told Joshua, fear not, I am with you. When, when Joshua was carrying the people of Israel into the promised land, Moses had died. Joshua is standing there with the people of Israel. God says, look, I know you're scared, but just trust me, be, I'm, I'm with you. Trust me, take courage, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. And he continues to encourage Joshua at that time. This is the same way that he encourages the people of Israel. Look, stay the course, keep going, it's going to be okay. Don't be afraid. And then he makes another promise. In verses 6 through 9... He says, here's why I want you to stay the course. Here is why I want you to continue. Don't worry about what it looks like right now. In verse 6, God says, Once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens. I'm going to shake the earth. I'm going to shake the sea and the dry land. In fact, I'm going to shake all of the nations so that the treasures of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory. The silver and the gold belong to me, says the Lord of hosts. This is the declaration of the Lord. In fact, the final glory of this house will be greater than the first, says the Lord of hosts. I will provide peace in this place. This is the declaration of the Lord. Of the Lord of hosts. God says, stay the course. Don't get discouraged. I know it doesn't look like much now, but I'm going to tell you a promise. I'm going to promise you that you remember the glory of the temple that you saw before, Solomon's temple? What if I were to promise you that the future glory of the temple that you're building right now that looks like nothing is going to be greater than Solomon's temple ever was? That would be some. That'd be a nice boost, wouldn't it? It'd be a nice kick in the pants. Get us, get you going. Hey, let's let's keep let's keep going. You see, it was God speaking forward, prophesying of something that of a future glory that was going to come into the temple that wasn't quite there yet. In fact, that glory that God spoke of. Whenever he talked about this this cataclysmic earthquake shaking of the heavens and the earth and the seas and the land. He was pointing towards his glory that was going to fill the temple. Not sometime now in the future. Not something that we haven't seen before. But something that the people of Israel were going to recognize. In fact, he wasn't going to fill the temple with the ornate beauty that Solomon's temple was. It was the, the glory of God was going to be recognized in the temple through the glory of Jesus Christ Amen. becoming present in the temple. Now see, I believe that we oftentimes we can take a look at prophecies that happen in the Old Testament and, um, and while there are some things that, that point way forward, even beyond our day and time right now that are yet to come, there were a lot of things that pointed to, and we were talking about 500 years before Jesus Christ were born, was born. So there are a lot of prophecies that pointed towards something that's, that's, that's already happened as well, if you consider where we live in this day and age. So the presence of Jesus Christ, the glory of the Lord, entered that temple when Jesus Christ was carried up into that temple, even as an infant. Listen to the words of the prophet Simeon. This comes out of Luke chapter 2, verse 29 through 32. Now they are in the temple courts. Mary and Joseph have taken Jesus, the young baby Jesus, into the temple courts... Mary, uh, they they did a a purifying, a a ritual cleansing um, rite there in the temple courts, but also Jesus was, was circumcised. And they're inside the temple courts, and this prophet Simeon sees Jesus, this child, 
And he looks his eyes to the heavens and he says, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You've prepared it in the presence of all the peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. And glory, there's that word, glory to your people, Israel. You see, what the Israelites had hoped for was the same uh, manifestation of glory that that God had, had shown in Solomon's temple. But God said, no, there's a greater glory that I want to show you. And it's not going to look like anything you've seen before. And Simeon, whenever he makes this proclamation, he says things that that God says through Haggai in chapter 2. What does he say? He says, this is going, in in, in verse uh, number 9, I will provide peace in this place. Simeon says, you can dismiss your servant in peace. I received the peace. The peace has arrived in the temple when Jesus Christ had arrived in the temple. Simeon says that you've prepared the salvation of your people in the presence of all people. You've you've, you've made him a light for revelation to the Gentiles. God says through Haggai in chapter 2 verse 7, I will shake all the nations... Simeon says that he's a glory. Jesus is a glory to your people, Israel. God says in Haggai chapter 2, verse 7, I will fill this house with glory. You see, the people, when they looked around in Haggai's day at the temple, they couldn't get past the physical uh, beauty or lack thereof of the temple. And God says, you know what? What looks unornate, what looks common, what looks not as pretty on the outside, I'm going to do something amazing with by bringing the glory of myself through Jesus Christ in this place. And you know, it was actually that same temple. It was that same temple that Jesus was brought in. In fact, the same temple that Jesus came and preached in. Every time he came to the temple, it was that temple that these people built. Now, yes, Herod built onto the, the, uh, the, the property of the temple. He expanded it. But the core of that temple, the Holy of Holies, the, the, the main sanctuary, that's what these people are building. This lackluster building that they looked at and go, God's not ever going to come to this place. We're, we're... God is like, oh yeah. Oh yes. I'm going to make something that looks common by the faithfulness of your hands, by the faithfulness of your work. I am going to make it holy. See, I believe that, like the Israelites, we can often uh, find ourselves with some misguided assumptions. We get this idea sometimes that um, maybe we're not doing enough, and it's, and it's only by our effort, by the work of our hand, that God's house is going to flourish Sometimes we believe that if something, if something doesn't, doesn't work out, it's because we didn't do enough. Or God's house is not going to flourish because we didn't do enough. And that's not just talking about the church as in our, our body of believers, but I'm also talking about our, the temple in which God lives in ourselves. We start to look at ourselves and go, well, maybe, maybe I'm just not doing enough. And the problem comes whenever we start saying, I'm not doing enough. 
I'm not doing enough. It all relies on me. The people of Israel looked at it and said, you know, we're, we're trying to make this look as good as it used to be. Maybe we're not working hard enough. Maybe we're not doing it. And, and God's never going to come and be in this place. God says, oh, yes, I will. You see, we make a mistake whenever we feel like it's our effort and our effort alone that builds and flourishes God's house. This place, this place, we feel like it's our effort alone. We feel like it all, it all points back to us. There's a fable I read of a, um, of a, a rooster. This rooster came, and it's a fable, okay, the rooster talks. The rooster comes into the farmhouse and he tells the farmer, he says, Farmer, you feed me all this grain and mush and stuff, and you you treat, you don't treat me well. You put me out in this coop where I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm liable to be attacked by coyotes and weasels. You know, I feel like you don't treat me like I should. And here's, here's what, but listen what I've done for you. Every morning I get up and I crow. And I crow and I call on the dawn. And whenever I crow, the sun rises and your men go to work. Your crops start to receive sunlight. They start to grow. Look what I do for you. Look what I do to, to try to, to, in growing your farm and supporting you. You should treat me better. The rooster went back to the coop, went to sleep that night. The farmer snuck into the coop and he took a piece of string and he tied it around the rooster's beak while the rooster was sleeping. The next morning came, the sun rose, the men went to work, the crops started to grow. The farmer goes to the rooster, he goes, would you look at that? The sun came up and I never heard a peep out of you. You know, I think that's sometimes how it is with us. We think that, hey, if I don't do, if I don't do this, if I don't do that, it, it all relies on me. And God's saying, no, it, your, your faithfulness and your obedience is important, but recognize that the power, recognize that the increase is by my hands. Paul said it perfectly. He said whenever he came with Apollos to share the gospel, he said, look, I I planted the gospel. Apollos watered, he taught. But God is the one who gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything at all. It's God who gives the growth. God had the right and the sovereignty to fill the temple no matter what it looked like with his glory. Because it was his temple. It was his building. It was his place. And he said, no matter what you do, even if you fall short, I'm, the, the, the increase, the blessing comes from me. Don't feel like you can build something better than I can build for you. Secondly, I think that we oftentimes we can get really caught up in our own flaws and our scars and our shortcomings. You think about the discouragement that the people of Israel, when they sat back and they looked at this this, uh, lackluster temple, and they thought to themselves how, you know, we can't, we can't do we, we we can't build anything like Solomon had built. Look at the look at the artisans that he had. Look at the the uh, the masons that he had. Look at the um, um, the skilled craftsmen that he had. We'll we'll never be able to to do anything like Solomon did. So they start they start bashing themselves, and maybe maybe. They're even believing things that the outsiders are saying. Look at all this 
work that you're putting into that temple. Look at all this money that you're putting into it. And it still amounts to nothing. It still doesn't look as good as it used to. And that gets discouraging, doesn't it? But one thing that we can know for sure is that regardless of the flaw, regardless of the scars, the shortcomings, regardless of, um, of our limited abilities, it's God's work, it's His holiness and His righteousness through Jesus Christ that gets the work done, that, that makes us flawless and holy. God was telling the people of Israel, it's not the building it's not the building that's going to bring my holiness. I'm going to bring my holiness. Some of you will know or have heard of um, the story of Kurt Warner. Uh, in fact, there's a movie that just came out recently about his, his life and his, um, um, his aspirations into the NFL. Kurt Warner was the, and still is, the only undrafted NFL player to ever go and win a Super Bowl, to ever go and become an, a Super Bowl MVP and a league MVP. He was undrafted. People all around him had thought that he wasn't good enough. People all around him had told him over and over again, you'll never, you'll never play on the professional football level. But something in Kurt kept him going, kept him striving. He didn't listen to the voice of the opposition. He followed what he knew that he could do. He knew where his power and strength was. Now, Paul tells Timothy, he said that God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. In fact, some translations use different words for that word fear. They use timidity, weakness, cowardice. God has not given us a spirit of these negative things, but one of power and of love and of sound judgment. And it's by His grace, by His free gift, that He gives us those things. So we shouldn't stand back and go, well, we don't have the ability, or we don't have, or, or I don't, um, I'm not the right person for that because I'm not equipped to do that particular thing. Or because of my past, or because of my scars, or because of my, my shortcomings, I'm never going to get the task done like God wants it done. God says, no, no, you don't understand. I'm going to make you holy and righteous in spite of all those things. And therefore, each one of us will know that we know that we know that it wasn't by our effort, but by the blessing and the mercy and the grace of God. I want us to meditate for a few moments on the word of the psalmist. It says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. He is my portion forever. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Some of us need to hear that this morning. Just as I know that the Israelites needed to hear the encouragement that God gave them when they stood outside the temple they were building and they become discouraged. Some of us need to hear and to know that God is sufficient. That God will strengthen us. It's His power. It's He's the strength of our heart. It doesn't come at our abilities or lack thereof. It doesn't come, um, it comes in the midst of and in spite of our brokenness. That's why it's called grace. 
because it's free. It's a gift, and, it's, and it's, it's given out of God's love for each one of us. Just as he told the people of Israel through Haggai, stay the course. You do what you know that you're supposed to be doing. Well, the, way, the way that the Lord is, is convincing you through the Spirit, keep going, be encouraged, be strong, know that I am with you. But also know in the midst of that, that it's not by your might or your strength that you're ever going to arrive to that place that you're looking for. Always know that it's God's grace and his blessing that's going to take you there. And that's exactly what God wanted to tell Israel. Know that it is, you, you do your part. You do what you've been asked to do. But at the end of the day, know that I'm going to put my glory in a place that I desire because of my sovereignty. Because I am God and you're not. No, I believe that whenever we come together and, and we, we observe what Jesus had initiated in the Lord's Supper, that that helps us to remember these very things. Our weakness, that it doesn't rely on what I can do or what I can't, that my... My scars, my, my past, my past sin, my past failures, it doesn't make a difference. Whenever we know and whenever we have received the forgiveness and the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Because it was His choice by His love and His blessing that He gave us Jesus Christ. Just as when Jesus was brought into the temple in God's time, when God, had, when God had brought to the fullness of time the point that he was ready for his glory to be in the temple. It's on God's time. That's what we mean when we say, when we say God is sovereign. God is great, God is good, God is sovereign. Jesus did for us what we were unable to do for ourselves. He allowed himself to be sacrificed for that brokenness, for those sins, for those failures, for those times of disobedience. He allowed his blood to be spilled to pay the price of that sin. And also to remind us, every time we take this meal, that it's not by my effort, it's not by your effort, that we receive the holiness and the righteousness of God. It's what God did first. It's what God does for us regularly through Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that as we take this meal this morning, and we reflect on your word. Lord, we obviously see your greatness. We see your holiness. We see your sovereignty from, from the beginning to the end. But Lord, what we also see is that it's your gift. Your gift of holiness, Lord, that comes on your terms. Your gift of holiness that was given to each one of us, brought into the physical temple, during the days of Jesus and brought into your spiritual temple during our days today.
in each one of our hearts. Lord, may we know this morning as we take the bread and as we take the cup that it was by the work of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that we are made righteous and holy, not by our own work. And may we recognize, Lord, that regardless of our shortcomings, our, our scars, re regardless of the way we look in the mirror and we see a lackluster temple to the eyes, you will, by your promise, bring your glory into that temple. By the power of the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. That's a promise, Lord, that you have given your people then. That's a promise that you have given your people today. We thank you for it, Lord. And I pray that now as we take the meal, we reflect on and we lay at your feet the places, Lord, that we try to outwork you. Put our hearts in a place this morning, Lord, that we just receive. Just receive your glory and righteousness through your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray, amen. Let's eat together.